All right, so welcome back everybody to today's session of the Cardiff Analysis Seminar. Today we're delighted to have Francois Pisseur from Manchester, who will talk about who works reliable eigensolvers for nonlinear eigenvalue problems. Thank you very much. So over to you. Okay, thank you, Matthew, and thank you for the invitation. Um, so uh, I'd like to talk about joint work with uh, um, my colleague, um, Stefan Wittel at the University of Manchester and um, my um, PhD student, Jean-Marie Negri-Portio. So, so this work is, um, is, is related to nonlinear eigenvalue problems, um, which I'll, um, I'll give um, a short um, introduction uh, in the next few slides. Um, but the main contribution in, in this work is really a, a new error analysis to improve um, uh, existing algorithms for the numerical solution of uh, eigenvalue problems, nonlinear eigenvalue problems, uh, um, and also um, new algorithms when um, the uh, matrix valued function that defines the nonlinear eigenvalue problem is provided as a black box. Um, by that, that means you, the only operation you can do is to evaluate uh, the um, matrix valued function at a particular point or evaluate it times a, a vector. And what we've also done is, is create um, a set of benchmark problems because um, there's been a lot of work um, done in the last um, eight, eight years um, in the, towards the development of um, new eigensolvers for nonlinear eigenvalue problems. But th there's a need for problems that you can use to test them on, uh, and in particular, benchmark problems. So, what's the nonlinear eigenvalue problem? Um, so um, here I'm going to work with um, a matrix F, uh, which is a matrix valued function um, from um, a non-empty optone set omega, uh, part of the complex plane um, into a CN by N, so N by N matrices. And uh, the nonlinear eigenvalue problem for this matrix valued function F um, needs to be defined on a target set, which I will denote by um, Sigma T. So this T really means target set. And that's a portion of omega. And we want to find scalars in, in, in this uh, target set. And non zero vectors, x and y, that satisfy those, those two equations here. So x um, is a, a right eigenvector of f with corresponding eigenvalue lambda if it satisfies this uh, equation. And y is a left eigenvector of f uh, associated with the eigenvalue lambda if it satisfies this, this equation. Um, so the, obviously the uh, eigenvalues are also solution of the, um, um, this uh, function, nonlinear fun um, function here, that of f of lambda. So that's, that's the characteristic, characteristic equation. Um, so that's just a, a brief definition of what the nonlinear eigenvalue problem is. I'll give a few examples uh, later on. But if you want to know more, um, uh, Stefan Guttel and I, uh, we wrote uh, a survey in ACTA in America a few, a few years ago. So, so some examples of um, nonlinear eigenvalue problems here. Um, you, you often see them when you study the, the stability um, analysis of differential um, delay differential equations. So you get equations of, of that particular form. And, and here you've got some delay. And when you look for solutions in the form u of t is equal to exponential lambda t times v, uh, then uh, you um, obtain a nonlinear eigenvalue problem where the, the nonlinear part occurs here in the form of an exponential. So that's exponential of minus the, the uh, lambda t, the, the uh, eigenvalue parameter. And for such problems, usually we're interested in the real part of lambda because it determines the group of, uh, of the solution U. Um, they also occur when you um, study differential equations with uh, nonlinear non boundary conditions. So uh, I've written such example here. You got a very simple second order differential equation here with um, so x is uh, lies in the interval uh, 0 and 1. And uh, at the extremity 1, uh, you've got uh, a condition of that form where phi of lambda is a nonlinear function. And when you discretize um, uh, with finite elements, for example, this, uh, this differential equation, uh, you end up with um, 
a non-linear eigenvalue problem, with, which is the sum of a linear term here plus a non-linear term. But very often, uh, when the uh, non-linear term comes from a, a boundary condition, um, the um, matrix um, to which the phi of lambda, the non-linear term, um, that multiplies the matrix, this matrix C3 is usually a floor rank, okay, because that corresponds to the boundary. Um, so it, when we develop algorithms, that's the kind of property you would like to exploit uh, whenever that it's possible. So those are just typical examples, but they're, they're not the only ones. Um, we've developed a collection of nonlinear eigenvalue problems, um, in particular matrices that you can download. Um, and uh, there's a lot more problems there if, if you're interested. So here I've got um, a very small two by two um, uh, matrix valued function f of lambda, but um, I always find it interesting because um, it's, it's, it's simple enough that you can, uh, but to illustrate a number of important properties. Um, so um, the eigenvalues of this uh, two by two uh, f of lambda, um, they are the roots of this um, characteristic equation here, the determinant of f of lambda, so it's just uh, exponential i lambda squared minus one. So here i is, is the square root of minus one. And it's easy to, to see that those are roots. Um, you can write them explicitly, and they are given in that form here. And they all lie on the other real line or imaginary um, line. Uh, I've plotted them here in, in the when the target set is the square um, limited by um, minus 8, 8 for the real, um, uh, the real part, and minus 8, 8 for the imaginary part. Um, but there's a, an eigenvalue at zero. In fact, it's a multiple eigenvalue, algebraic multiplicity, multiplicity two, um, and all the other are, are simple, but then they all um, leave um, zero and they get closer and closer um, to, them, to, to, to each other as you move uh, away from zero. But what's interesting about this, this two by two problem is that uh, um, but the left and right eigenvectors for absolutely all the eigenvalues, uh, it's, it's, it's this vector here or a multiple of that vector. So all those, all the eigenvalues, including the, the zero um, eigen, the eigenvalue at zero, they all have this vector here uh, as, an, as an eigenvector, both right, left and right eigenvectors. Um, so that's a big difference uh, compared to um, the standard eigenvalue problem a minus lambda i. Okay. Um, there's also a notion of eigenvalues at infinity, but we have that also for the linear case a minus lambda b when b is, um, is a singular matrix. So this eigenvalue at zero here is, um, is a defective eigenvalue, which we can easily see because um, when we evaluate f at zero, uh, we get the matrix of all ones and uh, and and trunk is one. So the null space dimension one and then you've got um, uh, it's equivalent to having a, a two by two Jordan block there. So just to summarize um nonlinear eigenvalue problem, they can have no eigenvalues at all. If you just take the one by one um nonlinear uh, scalar function exponential of lambda um, that uh, has no eigenvalue at all. Um, it can have um, finitely uh, many eigenvalues. So, for example, um, any um, matrix polynomial has a finite number of eigenvalues, and in particular, a quadratic matrix polynomial of that form here. Uh, if m, if the matrices are n by n, then that has two n eigenvalues with eigenvalues at infinity, some of them at infinity when M is a, is a singular matrix. Um, they, can, they can have count, countably uh, many eigenvalues. That's the case for that two by two examples I've just talked about. Or a continuum um, of eigenvalues, for example, the N by N zero um, matrix. Um, so I will exclude in the rest of this this talk, I will exclude that case here of continuum eigenvalues. 
and, and those problems are called um, uh, non-regular. So I will only work with regular problems. Uh, there are problems for which the determinant of the matrix valued function uh, is not identically zero um, on omega. So there are uh, interesting problems. Um, they can be, they, they tend to really be difficult to solve because of the non-linear aspect of the problem, but also they tend to be very large in applications. Uh, and um, they, they often have poor conditioning and, and poor, they are not well scaled as well. So they, they are non, non always trivial to, to solve. Um, we don't know where to look for eigenvalues very often. So that, that is, um, we don't know how many eigenvalues to look for and where to look for as well. So they, they are not, not um, trivial to solve. But really in the last um, yeah, eight to 10 years, there's been a, a huge amount of progress uh, done in, in the development of numerical methods to solve um, such problems. And, and those um, methods, they can be classified into um, three black, uh, three um, big uh, classes of, of methods. Those that are based on Newton's methods or Newton-like methods. Um, those that um, uh, use a, a contour integral approach and uh, those that use linear interpolation and linearization. Um, so um, those that are based on Newton's methods, they tend to compute just a few eigenvalues at a time. And usually you need to know well, you need to have a good idea of what to look for the eigenvalue because it's Newton based. So you need to have a good starting point. Um, the, um, the ones that are based on contour integrals, um, they're very interesting methods. They, they do work well, but they require setting up parameters and, and that's non-trivial. And those based on linear interpol interpolation, um, so the one I'm going to talk about today, uh, they also require setting up parameters, but that's the aim of this talk is to show that uh, you, can, uh, you can develop a function that you uh, call um, with inputs, the matrix valued function, the area of the complex plane where you're looking for eigenvalues. And that's about it and the precision to which you want to um, uh, um, compute your eigenvalues. Okay, so instead of now, instead of looking at, uh, it's instead of solving f of lambda, is v is equal to zero. So instead of solving the uh, original uh, non-linear eigenvalue problem, uh, what we're going to do is that we're going to approximate our uh, non-linear uh, matrix valued function by a simpler function, um, but that on the target set, so sigma t. And uh, uh, pra in practice, what we do is that we approximate f by um, either a polynomial or a, a rational matrix valued function, which I will denote by Rm um, of z. Okay, so it's a linear combination of base, basis uh, function, the bi of z, and those are either polynomials or, or rational functions of type nm, and, and uh, matrices rj that are uh, constant coefficient matrices. And um, you may think, but well, what's the point of doing that? Because it's still non-linear. Yes, it's still non-linear in the uh, parameter z or lambda. But it turns out that when we have a rational eigenvalue problem, so an eigenvalue problem where the matrix uh, is uh, as a um, rational function as uh, entries, then um, we have techniques that uh, allows us to rewrite this problem uh, as a linear problem of larger dimension, it's called a linearization, and then it's um, um, becoming more and more uh, available now. Uh, the linearization is going to depend on, on the BI, so the, 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 the basis you're using, uh, but um, we, tend, we know how to do that uh, now. Uh, so once we have a, a rational approximation, we can solve uh, this problem using a linear uh, pencil m minus lambda b of larger size. So really what we'd like to do is to approximate, find a, an approximation, um, a rational approximation rm of f, and then solve the eigenvalue problem in that way. But it's very important to have a good approximation. We want rm to approximate f well in some sense. 
otherwise um, uh, we won't be able to say much about um, how good the approximate eigenpairs of R m or the eigenpairs of R m are if they are considered as eigenpairs of f. So we're solving this problem, finding eigenvalues and eigenvectors of that problem, and we use them as approximation of f. But for that to, to make sense, we need to have a good approximation. And what does that mean? So what we really want is given the matrix valued function f, um, um, a discretization of our target set sigma t. So this discretization, we're going to call it sigma. Um, so we're going to compute quantities. We need to be able, we, we need to discretize our target, target set and we'll call it sigma. So we want f, a discretization of the target set and a tolerance epsilon. And what we want to develop is an algorithm that uh, compute um, uh, a rational approximation rm that satisfies this um, um, equal inequality here. So we want uh, Rm to approximate F in a relative sense um, in this way. So with a relative error uh, of, of epsilon. And here, the sigma norm is just this max here uh, over um, all the points in the, the discrete set uh, sigma. We also want our uh, rational approximation to be scaling independent. Um, there are approximations that, that are available that are not and to us that does matter because if you multiply alpha by a, sorry, your metric solid function f by a scalar, let's say alpha, this is not going to change the eigenvalues um, and the eigenvectors. But it, so for some, some of the methods, it's going to change the rational approximation. So we don't want that to, to be the case. Okay, so um, this condition that I'm imposing on the um, rational approximation to our uh, matrix valued function F, um, it's on the discrete set. But um, um, it turns out that we can show that if this hold uh, on the discrete set, then as long as um, F and um, the rational approximation are, um, are continuous um, functions on, on, on the target set sigma t, um, then the um, error um, on sigma t can be controlled by the relative error on the finite set, uh, provided that the um, discretization of the number of points we, we take to form sigma um, um, is, is large enough. So we want sigma to be dense enough uh, in, in, sigma, in the target set uh, sigma t. So that's what that says here. This uh, constant uh, C sigma, it's a measure on, on the density of, of discretization of, of sigma um, for the, the, the target set um, sigma t. But that's really all we can do. So um, we want to replace, we want to find the eigenvalues of and eigenvectors of f, but instead we're going to find the eigenvalues of r m. So we'd like to know how good those um, the eigenpairs of r m are uh, if we consider them as being eigen approximate eigenpairs of f. And for that we need to develop um, um, backward errors. We need to define the backward error, but that's not difficult. Uh, so we're going to consider that. If we have an approximate, um, if we if lambda hat v hat is an eigenpair of R m that we use as approximate eigenpair of f, um, then if that is the exact eigenpair of f, uh, how far it is? You no. Know, so if that is an uh, an exact eigenpair of the perturbed uh, f, how far it is? Uh, how far is this perturbed? Um, matrix valued function from the original function. And that's, that's our backward error. We want, we want to find the size of the mi minimal perturbation such that our approximate eigenpair lambda hat v hat for f is the exact eigenpair of this perturbed matrix valued function. And we want this, the size of the, the relative size um, of that uh, smallest perturbation. And that's our backward error. So in, on top of that, uh, lambda hat and v hat is, is an approximation of Rm because 
we use a numerical method to compute um, the eigenpairs of Rm, which we will. Um, those lambda had the attack approximation of Rm. What can we say about them as being uh, approximate uh, eigenpairs for X? And, and it turns out that under this condition here, uh, we can separate the error due to um, this eigenpair being um, uh, an, an approximate eigenpair for Rm and, and Rm being an approximation to F. And so we, we can show this um, particular um, upper bound. So that's an explicit expression for the backward error. It's not difficult to, to, to derive. It's a scaled residual, and we can bound it above by um, a quantity that involves the how well you are um, approximating um, your um, matrix valid function f by the rational Rm, plus a quantity that involves the backward error for lambda hat, p hat as an approximate eigenpair for Rm. We were able to separate the two. And what that tells us is that um, uh, if, um, I've it here. if if the, the backward error, if, if we compute well the backward error, uh, or if we compute well the approximate eigenpair lambda hat p hat uh, as uh, an eigenpair for Rm, so if it's less than epsilon, OK? And if this ratio is not too large, we, we would anticipate that that's going to be the case. And that constant here, which is a kind of measure of the density of sigma uh, in sigma t. So if that's not too large. Then uh, our approximate long, uh, eigenpair lambda hat v hat um, as an approximation to the eigenpairs of, of it, uh, will have a backward error bounded by epsilon. So this result here is quite important. It tells us that, um, if, that it's important to compute, to, to compute an approximation. That's, if we want to guarantee that our backward errors or, or eigenpairs are computed within a certain backward error, we need to make sure that the rational approximation uh, is as an error, a relative error that's below that. So um, I can illustrate this on these the two by two examples I've used uh, at the beginning because we know exactly what the eigenvalues are, we know what the eigenvectors are as well. So it's a, it's a good problem to, to test things on. Uh, so I've used an algorithm that I'll describe later to, come, to approximate um, this two by two matrix valued function by a rational. Um, so I've constructed three different rational approximations with um, increasing, um, no, sorry, decreasing uh, uh, relative errors. So, First one is 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 10, and so on. And of course, as you that corresponds to increasing value of, of the um, of n, so the, the, the degree of the approximate. And those are the backward errors. So the backward errors are always smaller than the error to which you're approximating, the relative error uh, for the approximator. And that's what the analysis says, uh, because I've Manage to compute the eigenpairs of Rm uh, with a backward error less than 10 to the minus 15, so almost to up to machine precision. So um, I'm getting here what, I'm ex what is expected. The backward error should be smaller than the relative error on the approximation Rm. I'm also able to calculate the relative error there because I know exactly what the eigenvalues are for that two by two problem. And, uh, and we know as a rule of thumb that the relative error is bounded above by the backward error times the condition number of the eigenvalues. Um, so here, um, there's a difference of 10 to the three between the relative error and the backward error. So that tells me that I can expect a condition number that is of the order 10 to the three and it turns out we can compute the condition number for the eigenvalues there, and that's exactly what, what, what it is. It's 10 to the 3. So um, the analysis, um, which should be correct, is at least um, um, observed uh, numerically. So how to compute um, those uh, rational approximations? Um, so we the way we do it um, depends on how the matrix valued function is provided to, to, to us. 
Uh, if it's provided in split form, which means that you can write it uh, as a finite sum of, um, of uh, nonlinear functions times um, constant matrix coefficient, where the number of terms is not too large. Uh, we want it to be much smaller than the square of the, the dimension of the problem. We can always write a metric value function in that way. That's, that's true. But we want S to not be too, we want to have a small number of, of terms. So what we do in that case is that uh, um, we approximate each of the FJ, those nonlinear terms, by, by a rational um, scalar function. That's the natural thing to do. So we replace the FJ of the, by some rational terms. And then we can put things together and rewrite it as a linear combination of uh, basis um, functions involving um, constant coefficient R i here. Yeah. OK, so there's a number of ways to construct this um, uh, rational approximation for the scalar functions. And, and one of them consists uh, of using um, the Cauchy integral um, formula. Um, but it requires the, um, you need the um, um, fj, those scalar functions, to be holomorphic. Um, and for that to work, you need to use um, a target, you need to use a set that's slightly larger than the target set, because you're going to apply your contour integral on the contour of that set here. And you do not want it to be, you don't want the contour to be equal to the contour. You don't want the contour of sigma hat to be equal to the contour of sigma t, because that is not defined, this f of z is not defined on, on on the contour of sigma t, and we want it to be defined there. So we have to take a slightly larger set. Um, um, set. And then we use um, a quadrature rule to compute this uh, contour integral. You can use your favorite um, rule. Um, but the point about that approach is that it's, it's very easy to construct. It's a natural approach, very easy to construct. But it requires um, uh, that choosing a slightly larger set. And this uh, larger set may, may be such that your um, function fj must still be holomorphic in that um, larger set. Otherwise, it's not going to work. And you need to make sure that um, the um, this contour here is sufficiently um, far enough from the contour of the target set. Uh, otherwise, um, things are going to be very large here. Um, so that's a problem with this approach. It's, it's, so it's very easy to construct, that's a plus. Um, but then um, it's difficult to choose um, the, um, the larger set, the sigma hat. Uh, and I can illustrate that um, numerically, again, on the two by two example, uh, why not? So here, my target set is just uh, the disk of center zero and, and radius three. Um, and um, I've so uh, I've chosen a, um, a set that's slightly larger than sigma t by multiplying the radius by some scalar alpha that's uh, larger than, than one. So what that plot shows is the um, relative error between the approximation uh, Rm, uh, the rational approximation or the rational approximant Rm and, and f uh, in terms of the degree. So, if I choose a contour that's very close to the, um, the contour of the target set, then the convergence is very, very slow. It's exponential, but very, very slow. If I increase the contour a little bit, if I make it slightly uh, further away from the, uh, the target set, then the convergence is a little bit faster, but still pretty slow. If I increase a bit more, then the convergence increases. Um, but if you increase too much, then um, convergence is still good, but you reach a certain limiting accuracy. You won't be able to go further than 10 to the minus 10. So in some situations, that could be enough. But it might be situations where uh, you might want to go further. Um, I've written, um, I've done some further experiments here using a, a different approach that I'm going to describe now. It's called the, um, it's the AAA uh, approximation. Um, I, explain the moment what it is, but that converges a, a lot faster. And faster is good because that means that you can get um, a decent accuracy 
with a, a smaller value for M. We don't want M to be too large because at the end, if we want to solve the eigenvalue problem and formal linearization, it's going to be of dimension MN. So the smaller M is the better. We don't want a, a linearization that's too large. Okay, so the, the triple algorithm, so triple stands for adaptive on Tula Sanderson. Uh, so what it does is that it, it interpolates our nonlinear uh, scalar function by a rational in barycentric form. And that's something that's been developed by uh, uh, Nakatsuka, Zaset, and Trepiton uh, fairly recently. Um, so they have a greedy selection of the support points, the sigma i. Ah. We lost sound. Yes, Francoise, I don't think we can hear you anymore. Can you, can you hear us? Okay, I think we have lost connection. Uh, yeah, now she's back. Can you hear us? We can now see your screen, but we can we still can't hear you. Okay, I'm no, back. I think. Yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. No problem. So I was explaining the um, the triple approximation um, that's been derived first for uh, uh, scalar functions, but you can extend it. Um, fairly easily to um, a matrix valued function. Something, um, those two algorithms that are there that are called the fast triple algorithm and the set value triple algorithm. Um, so, our contribution there is, is to use the analysis that we've done um, to tell us what we really want to do is to get a decent accuracy in, in the rational approximation to, to um, modify the stopping criteria so that we can achieve that. So um, I don't have lost control of my. So the what what's been published in, um, late, uh, recently is that you should use this stopping criterion um, to to construct your rational approximation, but that's not enough. Uh, it doesn't guarantee that your uh, rational approximation to f uh, will be um, will have a relative error of, of epsilon. Um, but if you look a little bit at what this quantity is, uh, it's easy to, to see that that's what should be used to develop a stopping criterion. And that is what we've done. We suggest to use this as a stopping criterion. But this stopping criterion uh, requires a quantity beta, which is an upper bound, uh, sorry, a lower bound on the sigma norm of f. So the sigma norm is the maximum value of f of z for z in sigma, uh, in, in, in measured in the two norm. Um, so as long as we have a lower bound on this quantity, uh, then we can employ this, this stopping criterion. And what this stopping criterion does is that it gives more importance, importance to the um, nonlinear scalar functions fj that, have a, um, that multiply a large um, a coefficient matrices which have um, a large norm. So if you have a coefficient matrix that has little importance, there's no point of trying to approximate it too well because it's not going to play a big role in, in the approximation. So um, no point of, of going too far in the, in, in the approximation and make it too accurate. And that's what this, this stopping criterion uh, allows you to do. So you may end up with a, 
uh, a rational approximation that's perfectly good, that will have a relative error below the tolerance that you're providing to your algorithm, while uh, the value of M will be smaller than, than if you don't use it. Of course, beta, this beta here, it's important that it's as close as to possible to this um, um, sigma norm of L. If, if you're too far, then you, you do too many iterations. Uh, but we have a, a fairly inexpensive way of approximating it. It's not always perfect, but we have a cheap way to, to find that data. So now that's when your matrix valid function is, ex is expressed in, uh, in split form. But when that's not the case, when the only thing you can do is to evaluate your metric valued function at a particular point in the complex plane, then you need to use a different approach. And, uh, and something we can do is, um, is to, to apply the, um, the triple M algorithm to this scalar function here. Um, and this scalar function, you can easily evaluate it um, because you just need to form this inner product here. And that's something we can do. Okay. So we can apply the triple A approximation to this scalar function and use the weights and the, the support point to construct um, a rational matrix valued function um, in this way. Um, but if we do so, there is no way for us to control the accuracy and there's really nothing we can, we can, we can do. And, and numerically we observe that it doesn't always work well. So something else needs to be done. But the advantage of something that's useful about this approach is that it provides information of where the poles are. And that's something that we may want to exploit. If we're given a black box or a different we don't necessarily know where the poles are. And that's very important to know where the poles are um, in order to, 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 to compute your, um, your rational approximation. So um, what we propose to do, and it's also something that uh, Campos and Roman uh, um, implemented in, in their uh, numerical linear algebra library, uh, SLEPC, is to um, uh, form this surrogate function. So it's, it's, it's a scalar function that you obtain by projecting to one dimension your uh, uh, matrix valued function f of z. So you obtain a rational approximation to this scalar function, compute its pole, and then uh, uh, apply a procedure that uh, um, was developed by Stefan Guttel and, and um, colleagues at uh, the University of Leuven, um, which is called NLI. Uh, so NLI is using a, lay a layer back B sampling to, to construct the rational approximation. I've described it here, but um, I don't want to get um, in, I don't want to spend too much time over it. it just um, uh, a procedure that allows you to construct a rational approximation, um, but it requires the knowledge of the, the, where the poles are. Okay. It chooses the, it will choose the poles and, and the, the, the nodes, but it needs to know where the, 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 the poles are, otherwise you can't employ this procedure. So you can find the poles using the triple algorithm and then just uh, apply them to this, to this approach. So I'll, I'll skip that. Um, another approach that can be done is, is, is use the, um, the um, triple A um, approximation using the surrogate function and, um, and refine it. Uh, and you can do that. You can keep this form here and um, use the layer back B sampling to um, refine this RD by adding more poles and, and uh, sample points. Um, so that's what we call the uh, surrogate triple A recycling um, layer back B refinement. Um, the, um, something odd about that approach, but this is not really not a problem, is that uh, you um, approximate your matrix valued function using different basis functions. So that will be um, those here, and the, um, they'll be different. The one used to create RD would be different than the one used to create this part of the, the approximation that uh, um, um, using rational uh, Newton um, basis function. But nevertheless, we can, sh we can, we have an algorithm that allows you to compute a rational approximation that satisfies our criterion. 
So I've explained that what we really want to do is have a, a function that we can apply to a problem without knowing too much about the problem we want. Um, like if you were to use MATLAB and for the I function, we'd like to have a, a function that we apply to a matrix valid function F and our target set, and maybe the tolerance to which you want to compute your, um, your approximation. That's all we, we want. So we've written such algorithm and we tested it on a number of test problems from the um, NLVP collection of uh, nonlinear eigenvalue problems. So those, those problems, they're a bit small, but um, they all have different kind of non-linearities. Um, sometimes the eigenvalue parameter appears in the form of a square root or an exponential or some more, more um, difficult function. They have um, varying sizes. Uh, we use different um, target sets. Uh, and um, we provided an estimation of the eigenvalues. Um, very often we have a good idea of how many eigenvalues we're looking for, but there are cases like for the sandwich beam where we think it's 168 in that particular target set, but we are not entirely sure. And among this set of problems, we, most of them are holomorphic, but there's a few who are not, which are not uh, holomorphic. So um, we know that the, um, the, the, the algorithms that are based on, on the, um, the, the black box approach, um, they may not work on, on those or not as well. So we're going to, in the numerical experiments that I'm going to present in a moment, we're going to compare the, the set value AAA algorithm, which is based on, based on uh, I would say, standard extension of the AAA algorithm. The weighted AAA algorithm, which is um, a, 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 a different stopping criterion that uh, use the weights of the coefficient matrices. Um, the surrogate triple algorithm, which we know won't work, but still is still useful. And um, NLite, which is uh, something that's been implemented in, in SLEPC, and uh, for which we compute the poles using surrogate triple L. And, and finally, the surrogate triple algorithm with uh, layer back refinement. Um, okay, so what we know is that the um, analysis tells us that if this one, this no, no, this one, this one, and this one. So weighted triple A analyzes and surrogate triple A with layer of refinement. We know that they will um, converge and they will provide uh, a rational approximation with the desired accuracy. So um, I've um, so I've, I've just called my function on those uh, uh, problems without setting any. Um, extra parameters and that's the, the thing, really something we wanted. We wanted to have a function for which we didn't have to set up any parameters. It's all chosen um, directly by the function. So what those uh, numerical results show is that um, the, um, so in blue, I've highlighted um, the, um, the algorithm that returned the rational approximation with lowest degree or within one of the lowest degree. And uh, um, it's mainly obtained for the, the AAA algorithm. So either set value or weighted AAA. They, they tend to, or most of the time, return the rational approximation of smallest um, degree. Um, none of those, by the way, fail. And, and that's what we were uh, expecting from the theory. The same with NLX and surrogate. Whereas surrogate AAA is not, uh, we know. Uh, we were anticipating that it would, wouldn't work. When I use square bracket, it just means that the code stopped, uh, but didn't return um, an approximation with the desired uh, accuracy. So here I've used a tolerance that is um, as, as smaller than the one from the previous slide. And what I'm returning here is not the degree, but the accuracy. Um, and uh, what, what the, I've highlighted in red, um, those problems and for a particular method, the problems for which the uh, required accuracy is not uh, obtained and surrogate AAA doesn't um, 
do that, but that was to be to be expected. The, the other uh, all return um, an approximation which is uh, with a relative uh, error that's below the, the tolerance. If I make the tolerance even uh, smaller, 10 to the minus 13, uh, again, the um, weighted triple M return um, um, well, doesn't fail. Set values and, and uh, weighted triple A, they, they do not fail. Um, the uh, interesting thing about weighted triple A is because it makes use of the weight of the coefficient matrices, it will return, um, in some cases, a uh, um, rational approximant with a smaller degree. So um, it tends to outperform the set value triple A, in particular for those problems where uh, the coefficient matrices they vary a lot in, in, in magnitude. I've got some stars here for any likes and, um, and, and so I get first layer back the refinement. It's because um, the algorithm didn't, did not converge with the, um, I set up a, 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 a loop uh, and then didn't let the, the algorithm carry on when the degree uh, went above 60. So it didn't reach the uh, required accuracy within the, uh, the number of steps. But this is not too surprising because those two problem bucking plates and um, the sandwich beam, they are uh, not holomorphic problems on the domain. And, and those methods, they are expected to, to not do too well. Um, those are um, um, plots of the, the target set as well as its discretization and where, where the uh, interpolation points and the um, poles are chosen. So um, as expected, um, when you have um, an holomorphic function, um, the interpolation nodes, they tend to be taken on the contour uh, of the domain, the target set. And that's the case for the gun problem. And the, um, well, all the problem except the button play problem. So um, all the, um, the the, um, the symbols that are round or square or the diamonds or those that are form a, a closed curve um, they they correspond to um, to to the interpolation points and the other symbol the crosses and the pluses they correspond to the to the poles so the poles they are they tend to be well they are always outside the domain except when you have a non holomorphic function like like in this case here. So poles outside the domain. Here we have the square root and those poles, they are on the, uh, the branch point of the, the square root for the gun problem. Um, but as you can see, the rest of the, the interpolation points are on, on the, the domain. Okay, so um, to conclude, um, what we've been able to show is that if we have an approximate uh, eigenpair, um, uh, of our approximation Rm to our metric solid function F with a backward error eta, then this uh, approximate uh, eigenpair can be used as approximate eigenpair of F with a backward error of A eta, as long as um, Rm approximate F with a relative accuracy epsilon that's smaller than this backward error. Uh, so that gives us an idea on how well we need to approximate our uh, or uh, F by the um, rational approximation. So we found out that the weighted triple A uh, algorithm, which is a variant of the set value triple A, uh, is a robust procedure to compute um, um, approximation to F as long as it provided in split form. Uh, and if you don't have a, a matrix that a matrix weight function that provided in split form, then we recommend the surrogate triple A algorithm with layer back the refinement. Um, but the function needs to be holomorphic on the target set. Uh, and we also hope that our set of test problems or of benchmark problems uh, will be useful for others who are developing uh, numerical methods for uh, eigenvalue, nonlinear eigenvalue problems. So we've made our codes available on GitHub and there's a, a, a MIMSI print uh, also associated with, with this work. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the nice talk. So questions for the speaker.
Um, could I ask about uh, the the Schrodinger ABC problem in a test set? Was that a PDE or an ODE? Um, this one, um, ah, let me check. That's one with um, I did not too long ago. Um, that's based on the Schrodinger problem um, with it's the boundary condition. Um, I don't remember. No, that's one of the recent one. Um, so you want it's 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 an OD problem, I think. Yeah, I, I was curious because um, one of my PhD students was looking at a a, a PD Schrodinger problem where she had a, a lambda nonlinear bound boundary condition, which was non-local even. So it, it was an operator acting on the boundary. And um, and I guess one of the, you know, when I, when I was watching your talk, I was thinking, so which method that you were talking about would be the best one to use? And I, um, and I guess I guess the curse of dimensionality is starting to, to worry me a little bit, right? Because for, for, the, for the PDE, the, the matrices you get from the finite element discretization are already really, really big. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But when we construct the linearization, it's going to be huge. Yeah, that's, that's the problem. But it's really structured. And uh, if you use, um, if you only want some of the eigenvalues, you can use a, um, a quite of method like. Um, we recommend rational Arnoldi. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, all you need to do is um, you have to invert your matrix valid function at particular points in the complex plane. So it will still be, if n is the dimension you started with, it will still be inversion of n by n matrices, not of the big one. So, so we were using uh, we were using a contour integral method from your uh, from your Act in America review. Oh yes, you can do that as well. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I mean, we got some really strange results. I mean, uh, it seemed that at least for our problem, uh, one had to be really careful about the, the choice of the contour and even about the quadrature around the contour, it was possible to get the even the eigenvalue count completely wrong. Um, yes. Uh, mm, the bad right. quadrature. So the code that we provided in the uh, Acta Numerica survey are really basic codes. Uh, we have one that works much better now for the, it's a much more advanced code for the, the contour integral case. Um, yeah, it's... I don't I don't think we were necessarily using your code. Sorry, I didn't mean to suggest. You right, okay. your no, code no, it, it no, because I think they are very, they are too basic our codes to, um, they were just meant to, uh, as an illustration. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so the, the problem with the, the contour integral, I mean, it's not that there's a problem, they do work well in general, but there's still the question on which quadrature would to choose, um, how many points to use, uh, and, and this is really influenced by whether you have poles inside the domain or not, you can have poles in the domain, I don't know if that's the case, or whether the poles are, are close to, to the contour as well outside or inside. And if the eigenvalues that are close to the contour, whether inside or outside as well. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and it does affect the quality of the computation. But you said that you were not even able to determine how many eigenvalues inside. It, it, it was very strange what would happen is, I mean, we, we gave it even a problem where, uh, ju just as a starting test problem, we gave it one where we knew the eigenvalues were all real. Uh, what, what it would do is it would um, it would split the eigenvalues into uh, in, uh, so it would split the real eigenvalues into complex conjugate uh, pairs with small imaginary parts, and then it could also introduce a few additional. Uh, imaginary, uh, sorry, uh, non-real eigenvalues, which we had not, uh, didn't know about. These would go away if we refined the contour, the integral around the contour, but it really seemed that you know, we were integrating around an elliptic contour and 
so so in theory the 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 uh, you, uh, the, the the rate of convergence with respect to the number of quadrature points should be exponentially fast because the function is yeah. periodic. But you don't actually in practice see that exponential rate of convergence until you have a really large number of mesh points. So it takes a long time before you get into the asymptotic regime, at least in our horrible case. Maybe we just have a very nasty problem. So it seems to me like you must have eigenvalues that are very, very close to your um, contour, both inside and outside. No? Yeah, I, I, I didn't think they were that close, but it's possible that they were close as far as the algorithm was concerned. You know, they were certainly within one. Okay. It just depends on what means how large your yeah. domain is. Yeah, yeah. I don't know that. But we'll certainly <laughs> yeah. go back and try some of your other algorithms now. Right. We have um we have a code that works well. I can ask my John Maria if he's, he's happy to, to provide it for you to try. Or if you're happy to share your, your matrices. Um, Sure, I'll, I'll, ask, I'll ask Salma if she can dig them out. Yeah. Thank you. But they are, they are not easy to, to solve those problems. Um, and ideally, we'd like to have um, a MATLAB code that you can just call simply, in particular, for those problems that are not too large. You know, you can just call without having to choose the parameters. More questions for Consuets. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, if you if you know something about something, uh, some additional information about your um, function, uh, say it's um, you no know, in the class of these R functions that have. Um, uh, a positive imaginary part in the upper half plane. Would mm -hmm. would you be able to get something, uh, you know, increase efficiency of this, of this approach? And uh, yeah, I guess there is a there, there there may be some good candidates for this rational approximation, right? Oh well, yes. Um, I wouldn't use it. I wouldn't use that approach if I had um, uh, a cert certain classes of, of problems where we know the eigenvalues lie on the imaginary axis or on the real line. Um, so, so, so there are special classes of problems where um, there are, if I want to compute eigenvalues, I wouldn't use that machinery. I would just go ahead with, with all the techniques that are based on um, uh, min-max characterizations. Um, but here you're talking about complex eigenvalues in the complex plane. Um, and if you want to find them, um, that's one way to do it. Um, the other approach is to use a contour, um, contour integral um, method. Mm -hmm. But um, the fact that they are all in the upper part of the complex plane, I'm not too sure how to, to use that, except that we know where to look for them. We don't need to use, look at the lower part. But, um, I would, we would need to know more about the property of, of the, the problem. Well, they would be, they would be on the real line, but, uh, but they, they would be real value, the eigenvalues. But, uh, but um, as, a, as a function of the complex variable, it has this property, right? Yeah. Um, that basically is related to the uh, physical assumption of passivity. So, yeah, okay. So many, many physics problems uh, lead to this kind of nonlinear eigenvalue problem if you, if you formulate them appropriately. That's correct, yes. And, and so, yes, you can exploit, but it's a different, different class of methods. Mm -hmm. you so, so, you would not be using this approach then? No. Mm -hmm. If I know that uh, my problem has a, 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 a so, so they need to have some definite, we call that definite. Kind of properties and, and min max char char characterizations, then I would use um, mm. other techniques like the um, safeguarded iteration of um, mm -hmm. uh, n response, for example. Um, right. That seems to work very well. Right. Okay. Thank you.
in particular if the eigenvalues are on the real line, you, you can order them. There's a way to count them, um, and that's extremely helpful. Right. Thank so you. No, what I discussed today is in the general case where you don't know anything. Mm -hmm. um, so more questions for the speaker? So if that's not the case, let's thank Francoise again for the nice talk. Thank you. Thank you very much.